I want to bring in uh, Marvin now, Marvin Reese. He's the mayor of Bristol, which is the city where he was born and, and he was brought up. He was elected mayor in May uh, 2016. And on that day, Bristol became the first major European city to have a elected to have elected a mayor of black African heritage. Now he's had a long career. He began his working life with Tier Fund, which is, as we know, an inter international development agency. He went on to spend time working in the US with social justice organization and with President Clinton's advisor, Tony Campolo. And coming back to the, B to the UK, he worked with BBC Bristol as a broadcast journalist with the Black Development Agency. Uh, supporting BAME-led voluntary sector and the NHS uh, Bristol public health team on delivering race equality and mental health, an issue which is absolutely now at the forefront of our minds. Um, he, he, during my, his first term in office, he's overseen the building of over 8,000 homes, announced the development of a mass transit system and provided quality work experience for over 3,500 children who wouldn't readily have access uh, the council has living wage employer status. Uh, Channel 4 have moved to Bristol. Uh, it's definitely a city on the up. And we're delighted to have Marvin talk to us a bit about his experience in the city view. Marvin, over to you. Yes? Unmute. <laughs> I think I'm off mute now. Yeah. Well, thank, thanks for the um, invitation. And I, I, I wish I was here for the full... Um, uh, conversation, but if, if you know, if I'm understanding right, it, I'm talking a little bit about race. I mean, my experience growing up would be similar to um, many uh, young people um, across the country. They had a little bit of nuance, uh, I, I suppose. Again, not dissimilar to others. My mum, uh, white woman, unmarried, uh, not much money. 1972, brown baby on the way. That had all sorts of stigma. So growing up, I think what I what I experienced and witnessed uh, was my was my own blackness and the usual that went along with that um, from um, uh, from verbal abuse to physical threat to um, low expectations on occasion. I had some outstanding teachers and people around me, so I'm not saying it was all bad. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Uh, but there were occasions in which I definitely know we were being there was low expectations upon us. So I experienced all that, but I also watched my mum struggle as the daughter, or the, as we'll say, the granddaughter of a, a Welsh miner, Tally Bach, uh, his name, and um, her father, who was a migrant worker, essentially from South Wales. So she struggled as a working class white woman with all the stigma of being a white woman with a brown baby in the 1970s. So um, the, the, those, those things echoed their ways, uh, the, those uh, ways through my life. So there's a, there's a couple of reflections I'd offer off the um, uh, the back of that. I suppose I've I've, I've tuned into over the years. Uh, one is that uh, clearly I think the race racism and the consequences of racism is real. Um, there's some debate over the last few days about its impact and so forth. Like, you know, I think that can be can, you know people can go up and down on on how prevalent it is, but it is real. And um, and the question is, what do you do in the face of that reality? Um, do you do something or do you say it's too difficult to do something and do uh, next to nothing? Um, I think we should do something in a very complicated uh, world. I think and I, I think our, the challenge of race cannot be separated from the challenge of class. And, and I'm, one of my points often is, and even on the left of politics, I say, you know, some people and I have had it said to me on the left, don't talk about race because you're dividing the working class. Now, my point is, I, I think we need to talk about race. We need to talk about class. What we shouldn't do is um, pretend they are exactly the same things. But what I do recognize is I can't talk about one without the other. So by way of example, uh, when people start talking about a post-racial a post -racial world, um, as though somehow race doesn't matter anymore, I think one of the most important uh, documents of the last kind of six years to point to, and it's not a huge read, was um, the Social Mobility and Child Poverty Commission's Elitist Britain. Uh, forward written by David Cameron, John Major, uh, Nick Clegg, um, Ed Miliband. So it's not some kind of, you know, fringe document here that said the relationship between the British elite and people's socioeconomic background is so strong, it actually looks like social engineering. In fact, um, you might ask the question, to what extent does the British elite reflect talent and ability rather than background? Now, if we haven't solved the issue of social mobility, or should I say social immobility, how on earth do we think we solve the issue of race and the impact that race has on 
uh, um, uh, having an unequal distribution of life chances on people. We haven't even solved the issue of uh, so, um, class, which tra- in many ways we just incorporate uh, poor white people in the country. So for, for me, by definition, um, we, we should be very careful in that kind of language of progress, not least as well, because I think people often confuse um, fighting racism with one of politeness. If we're nice, if we listen to world music, if we eat world food, and if we can sit around a campfire and sing Kumbaya together, somehow we've made progress on race. When for me, issues of race and racism has all, have always been about power and wealth. And the true solution to it comes when we tackle those inequalities um, of opportunity, life opportunity, particularly around the accumulation of power and wealth. The, third, the, the other thing I would just say, which is a complexity that I enjoy sharing with people is, I think white privilege is real, but my white mum did not lead a life of privilege. So these are difficult, but these are difficult truths to reconcile. But nonetheless, they are, they are true, and and I, with my sense anyway. Um, and it just means that it's a very difficult uh, world to navigate. So as I talk about uh, race and confront the reality of race inequality in Bristol, what I am very aware of and need to tackle at exactly the same time. And this comes through during the Colston statue hauling down, by the way, and a cenotaph rally that happened the weekend after was that many white people are being left behind in the city by, by a very prosperous economy. We, we are a very wealthy city, but we have six areas in the top 1% most deprived in England, over 40 in the top 10%. And holding those inequalities together, uh, holding the city together across those inequalities is, is very challenging, particularly when it comes down to the need to talk about uh, race um, inequality as well. It makes for a very difficult field of play. So it's just a couple of my uh, reflections, if they add anything to the conversation. Absolutely. But can, can you just tell us a little bit more about how you've evolved your thinking about what a city can do, what a particular environment, uh, you know, which has a strong identity as a city and a strong history as a city, and now has you as mayor. Tell us a little bit about how you came to the realisation that the city, uh, the governance of the city itself, could make a difference and what those areas have been. Because I think, you know, a lot of people around the country will be looking to see, you know, wh- what assessment you've made and how you came to that view in a very positive way. I mean, Yeah, so uh, city, I think th- this fits within a broader question of the place of city and national and international leadership now. And I think what, what, we're, what we're seeing at the moment is that national governments are just not able to cope with the world the way it is if working alone. They're too turgid, they're too slow, and, there's, and their power is too distant from people's um, everyday lives. They are needed, and I'm not saying they're not needed, but it was an American mayor that said to me, we have the best model of 1960s governance we could wish for. The problem is it's 29, well, he said it in 2019. Uh, the problem is it's not 1960s anymore. So we urgently need cities to, uh, to be able to shape, have much more power to shape what goes on inside their boundaries, but also to shape the national and international context in which they have to work. But what we do have access to at the city level are, the, are some of the nuts and bolts of inequality. Uh, so affordable housing, we've, we've driven uh, forward on affordable housing. Housing has always been one of the biggest determinants of race inequality, whether it determines where people live. And when my mum had me, the only place she could find to live was City Road in St. Paul's because of all the uh, stigma, which is where a lot of the Jamaicans uh, uh, you know, had moved to in, in that area. So um, be it delivering affordable housing, the work we're doing on tackling t- uh, child hunger and poverty, uh, 56% of children in my, in my city when I was elected were not getting access to meaningful work experience. And we know which 50, 56% that was. That's why we set out to provide children with those opportunities to get uh, work experience. We've also um, been pretty frank about our own situation. So as soon as I was elected, I set up two reviews. One was on a gender pay gap and one was on a race pay gap because we wanted to know what was actually happening, pound for pound, skill for skill, on the experience of women and people from black and, and brown backgrounds in, in the economy. And, you know, I mean, it, it's obvious what happens, right? <laughs> they get paid less on both, uh, on both fronts. So we, we were very transparent on that front as a local authority. And, and through that transparency, we we're able to um, encourage other city partners to be transparent um, along, along with us. In fact, and, and me being me, and obviously, Uh, My blackness helps with that because I was able to give some of those organisations some cover um, by saying that if you are open and transparent, we're not going to have you hauled over the coals, but transparency and openness and knowing what your data tells you is a first step towards progress. Right? You measure, you can make. We've also set up um, our Commission on Race Equality, chaired by uh, Professor Olivet Otelli, 
Um, I think she's the only black uh, uh, professor of history in the country, an amazing uh, woman. Um, and we launched a program called Stepping Up, which is now being looked at by other cities as well, which uh, uh, we, we begun to identify um, black and Asian people stuck at mid-management level um, and, and supported them for, with a year of mentoring, a stretch tie. Um, and, and amazingly, it was the private sector that really drove that. The tri private sector were um, in full recognition of their need to access a diversity of thought um, uh, to be more dynamic, to understand their markets better. 60% um, 60, 60 of the people that participated in that first cohort went on to get promotion. So it talks to you about how you can unlock, unlock uh, talent that had been uh, stumped. Um, the first cohort was, was around race. The second cohort and the third cohort are now taking in uh, women and disabled people as well, as we recognize the impediments to progress uh, through the hierarchy of organizations. And again, the outcomes of that have actually been real. People are getting promotions uh, when they're given a bit more coaching, a few more contacts, how to navigate uh, uh, the system. Um, and in 2019, we hosted a, a city discussion. Simon Woolley came down, which is great, but we had our, our chief constable and our chamber of commerce. So we've mobilized the city around a conversation about race. What I constantly point out is this is not about guilt. This is not about making anyone feel bad. All right? I don't go home and give my white mum a hard time for being white. This is just about saying, what does the world look like? How does it work? And how are we going to confront that? And let's just be real about it. It's not an emotional conversation for me in many ways. Just tell me a bit about how difficult has it been? You've, you've talked quite rightly about the, I hate the phrase intersectionality, but let me just use it as short. How difficult it is when you're deciding projects to do to kind of balance all those, those different aspects of um, of, of the need for inclusion? Have you... I, are you able to do that because you've got so many different stakeholders representing all the different communities? How do you do that? Do you mean balancing off the different challenges of inclusion, like as in well, well, women, when you're, disabled when you're, people, gay people? Well, when you're selecting projects or when you're developing projects, um, I mean, is it your experience that, it, that it's, sometimes it can be more divisive than otherwise? How do you bring projects together that would look at, for example, the uh, experience of white working class girls or, or, or you know, people who have uh, underneath the social mobility issue, people who've got different characteristics. People don't fit into neat pigeonholes, do they? They've got a multiplicity of, uh, yeah. so how do you, you know, given the limited resources that, that, that you've got as a city, how do you come to decisions about what to prioritize? To be honest, I, I, I'm not sure how to engage with the question because it's not something that's actually caused me much agony. Maybe I'm just not made emotionally tuned in. To, <laughs> not at all. But um, we, we, we've, I think we're known, but we're, we're, we're taken seriously for our concern about people being left behind. We, we are unashamed in our level of aspiration. Right? That's why we bid for Channel 4. Uh, the, you know, I mean, bidding for Channel 4 in and of itself doesn't present itself as a you know, inequality is issue, but we're saying, look, we, we want to be in the game, you know, we, so we're going to be freshly aspirational. And I wouldn't have made progress from the circumstances of my birth unless I, unless I was aspirational. Um, at the same time, uh, what we want is an economy that builds inclusion rather than grows, and then we try and retrofit inclusion mm. onto a bad economy. That's a very expensive and inefficient way of doing things. Mm. Um, we build an, un, an uninclusive economy. They turn up in public services, in the criminal justice system. Um, in our hospitals and we're talking about the cost the burden of this so it just makes financial sense I, I i think maybe because because we and again i i don't want to profess that how people see me but i think because we've developed a bit of a city brand for um wanting to do economic inclusion i if i'm focusing on the issue of race or women or disabled people it does not mean that i'm not talking about something else it just means i'm talking about this at this moment in time mm. i'm actually quite um assertive in, in, in making that case. I think sometimes historically equalities issues have been used like top trumps and I've seen it in Bristol. You know, you give me class, don't worry, I'll count your story on class with my story on disability. You know, I tell you a story of disability, I'll count it out with my story on, on, on gender. We're saying, look, we can't play them like top trumps, right? Most people sit across many um, identities and we got to do what we got to do where we can um, and do it. And it's not always very pretty. <laughs> sometimes it's about uh, grabbing victories where we can. So what, just can I ask you, what surprised you over the past six months in terms of how your community has responded to uh, COVID, particularly in the context of the progressive things that you've been trying to do? 
How, I mean, have you been uh, encouraged by some things or something's been more difficult? There's two, there's, there's, there's two themes, on, uh, two, two features on one theme, right? One is the level of public support that's come out, just volunteerism, right, mm. of people in their communities. In fact, we, we had to move very quickly because we'd already started to organize through, we've developed an approach in a city called the One City Approach, which I won't get into here, but, um, but we had platforms to, to, through which people could volunteer their time. We, very quickly, we had over 4,000 people coming forward, um, individuals, uh, taxi drivers. So, so even when the government, um, and this is not a part of, I think it's the, it's the national machinery more than it's government, so, so say, but when, the, when we had problems getting our emergency food packages uh, to the city, uh, we had our own food distribution system set up and we had taxi drivers that we'd managed to keep on a contract to try and keep wages going, distributing food um, to, to people in dire situations. So the, the danger, the, the threat of hunger was with us and made real in some people's lives, but actually we countered quite a lot of that um, very early. Um, but also because of the work we've done over the last few years on building up the soft relationships between our key institutions, ourselves, um, our universities, our trade unions, our business representatives in Business West Chamber of Commerce, um, our voluntary sector faith groups. Uh, what we've had very quickly was that collection of organizations coming together, recognizing their interdependence. Um, so I host a, a city leaders breakfast every three months. Um, and it's like I say, it's got all those people that I've just mentioned from all those sectors, about, about 15 to 18 people. Well, I made, I said, look, we're in a crisis. Should we meet weekly? And now every Wednesday at 12.30, I'm on the phone. We're, we're proactively taking on challenges, student infection rates, public transport challenges, um, safety in the workplace. So conversations between the unions and employers are happening upstream rather than downstream mm. when you end up with a conflict and division. And I, I, so it, it's been a, a real pleasant surprise, although not total surprise, but a, a surprise nonetheless to see the extent to which people have been uh, willing to come together if we develop the right culture and put the structures in place to support it. Yeah, and no, I think your point about structures is an important one, you know, having the, the architecture, you know, to have those uh, conversations. Um, Caroline, reflections on some of what um, uh, Marvin's been saying.